Greetings from the Dark Continent, Conscious Caracal here, or Adams Van Sale. And as a continuation of my lockdown streams, where I talk to a bunch of uh, relevant people in terms of their fields of expertise regarding the lockdown and how they can teach us a bit more or enlighten us a bit more about what's going on out there and what you can expect from the future, uh, I'm talking tonight to Mr. Russell Lamberti. He is an economist, and he is going to tell us a bit more about the economic uh, angle to this lockdown and what you can maybe expect in the future, and maybe just enlighten you a little bit on what is actually going on uh, in this very complex thing called the economy. Uh, thank you very much for joining me, and welcome, Russell. Alan, uh, it's really, really good to be with you finally, and uh, uh, pay my respects to all your... Uh, all your viewers, good, looking forward to a good discussion. Thanks for having me. All right, excellent. So just before we start, um, I always, uh, instead of using the, the, the more traditional method of uh, explaining who you are, I think I'm just going to give the microphone to you because I think no one else knows who you are better than yourself and what is relevant and what is important. So just give a very small uh, elevator pitch on who Russell Lamberti is. Thanks, Ernst. I'm Russell Lamberti. I am the founder of a company called ETM Macro Advisors. Um, it's a partner company with a company called ETM Analytics. Uh, ETM Analytics is based in Joburg. I'm based in Cape Town, and we basically do uh, financial market and macroeconomic advisory services for professional investors. Um, so I've been an economist now for going on about 16 years. Um, I advise uh, high net worth clients, uh, large financial institutions, uh, small financial institutions, um, and some non-financial sector companies. And my main field of expertise is helping my clients navigate their capital um, through business cycles, through through different asset cycles, helping them allocate capital to, to the appropriate asset classes depending on where we are in, in the economic cycle, the business cycle, but perhaps also understanding bigger macroeconomic and sort of secular trends. So, so that's that's my speciality. And then I suppose on the side, I've, I've got a little Twitter hobby uh, where I like to be quite um, forthright and vocal in a sort of political economy sense um, about the, the current affairs of, of things that are going on in the world. So so that's my background, um, and I hope that I can bring with that background to your show today just some some incisive comments around the economics of this problem and maybe a little bit around the politics of this problem that we face uh, in the world at the moment. Hmm. So something that I think uh, a lot of people have, people have noticed is that economists kind of travel in packs. Uh, you guys have frequent conversations with each other, uh, bounce some ideas for, uh, in terms of what's going on and just that there's a there seems to be a network between you not just lone wolves in this regard so just mm -hmm. maybe to to lay the groundwork um what is the general feeling uh, among south african economists currently regarding this lockdown just a very general uh um vibe that's an interesting question because economists are perhaps less of a pack than you think um we we disagree a lot with one another we, we often protect our turf. Um, we like to think that we have the special insight uh, into something that other economists don't have. Um, and so what you often find with a lot of issues, particularly around political economy issues, you find a lot of disagreement amongst economists. What I've been quite, um, what I found quite interesting with, with the corona crisis and the, and the lockdowns and uh, I'm not sure how I feel about this. Sometimes a little bit worried, <laughs> but but I've I've found a, a fair degree of of agreement. Consensus would be the wrong word, but certainly a fair degree of agreement around around the the broad sort of quantum of how bad this is going to be. These lockdowns are going to be for our economy, um, and you know the it ranges from from you know very bad to to kind of catastrophic i mean there's there's no there's no economists that are that are saying that this is not going to be a very big recession <laughs> you know everyone believes that it's le at least going to be a very very big recession or something like a depression something like you know the worst that we've seen since since maybe the 1930s um and i think it's because you know for the first time <laughs> Uh, it, we're not so much grappling with very complicated business cycle dynamics 
um, but we're actually dealing with with shutdowns. You know, we we know which sectors are mostly shut down. We have a pretty good idea of, of what's happening to revenues across across certain kinds of sectors. This isn't a perfect science, of course. Um, and we're also now starting to get early data out of places like China. So the, the first in the first quarter, uh, China's economy fell on an annualized basis. In other words, if, if you extrapolated what it, what it did in the first quarter for an entire year, it fell uh, on an annualized basis by 36%. Huge, huge drop in Chinese GDP in the first quarter of 2020. So we know that with South Africa's draconian lockdown, um, we know uh, based on the sorts of job numbers that we're seeing overseas and that we'll start to see in South Africa, that we've got to start we've got to really be bracing for for something very very big here and i think most good economists are somewhere in that ballpark uh here's a just a flattering message for you russell uh sideline opinion says russell you're a brave young man to speak your mind as honestly as you do i, I wish i wish i was young i wish i was young <laughs> <laughs> and then also also nice to see quentin ferreira in the chat uh, i had him on a few uh, just uh, i think a week ago or two weeks ago to give the psychology side to, to to the lockdown very fascinating chat you guys can find it on my channel and he also says that uh, i agree i like this gent a lot <laughs> all right so now if, now that you've uh, laid that groundwork if you look at now for example what's happening across the world especially now china i think is a very interesting and relevant case and you're talking about a recession you're talking about a depression uh, just to maybe clarify that a bit more for the listeners this is not just in the south african context this is part of a bigger picture they're talking about a global recession or a global depression if i'm correct yeah so so regardless of what we did with lockdowns i mean if we left our economy mostly open say like sweden did we would still be facing a, a big recession this year in South Africa. Um, our trading partners, all our major trading partners, if they had done what they have done, which is mostly go into some form of lockdown, uh, this would have affected us uh, very, very badly anyway. Um, <clears throat> I just think that we're compounding the problem. We're compounding the problem in South Africa here by instituting arguably the most draconian lockdown in the world, uh, possibly you know, I don't know all the specifics, but possibly China was able to create, you know, a similar or, or maybe even uh, more restrictive kind of lockdown, and particularly in Wuhan and, and maybe in some of the other places. Um, I don't really see anywhere in the world, possibly Spain, possibly Italy, that, that are doing what we're doing in South Africa. Um, I, I, I stand to be corrected, but I, th uh, I think I read from the Sarkelicher, um submission to to the government on the lockdown that they've generated 500 pages of regulations in the last month um, to administer various lockdown rules. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm misquoting that. Um, I'll, I'll go and double check that later. But uh, if that's true, it's it's and it wouldn't surprise me. It's a very, very telling sign of, of the kind of sort of uh, regulatory duress, if you like, that we're under. So South Africa are compounding is compounding the problem. But this is very much a global problem. This is this is what this is probably the first time, maybe since the since World War II, but probably ever, probably ever that we've seen such a synchronized shutdown of the global system. It's quite astonishing, and it's going to have, I think, very lasting, uh, very lasting ripple effects, mm. um, not only on South Africa but but on the world economy. Mm. And now as you pretty much look at a bunch of uh, other international countries, really also, like you said, going into a lockdown, it doesn't seem to be a, a unique thing to South Africa. Are there any countries that stand out to you as countries that you actually think are doing better? They might not have a perfect formula, but that you think is are actually better role models for South Africa to follow than, for example, what it seems that we are following, the China model. Is there anyone that stands out to you just uh, off the top of your head that you think would be a better role model for South Africa? Look, I, I haven't spent tons of time studying countries. We all know that Sweden is the sort of poster child, so-called experiment. Um, uh, I actually think that the, the real experiment is is the draconian lockdowns. That's a radical social experiment. Uh, what Sweden are doing is, is basically called normal, normal life. It's very moderate. They're obviously not doing nothing. They've got 
they've got social distancing measures in place. I presume that there's kind of probably quite a strong socially enforced, you know, set of norms and behaviors that is going on in Sweden. Um, but by and large, they seem to be following, I think, a very, very sensible path. And the the early data, as well, it's, it's more than early data now, the, the ongoing data, I think at the very least suggests that Sweden is no better off or no worse off from a coronavirus perspective. The data I've been looking at shows Sweden is definitely better off from an economic perspective. Um, if you look at vehicle sales, for example, over the last uh, month or two, uh, car sales is a really useful indicator. It's, it's well-reported data. Um, it's kind of quite standardized data across the different countries. It's, it's, a, it's a consumer credit-linked big-ticket item purchase, so it speaks to household financial strength. What you saw in, in February, uh, no, sorry, what you saw in March was um, an absolute collapse, absolute collapse in vehicle sales across, across Europe. Italy and Spain, obviously, but not just restricted to those economies. Sweden, you saw a decline, but so far, and you know, we'll, we'll see more data coming in, but so far Sweden holding up much, much better than everyone else. So that seems to me like a really sensible approach where you, you're clearly taking some risk mitigation strategies, but you're saying, hang on a minute, we can't just shut down society. We can't just shut down real life. Things have to carry on. Risk mitigation and risk management is, is, not, a, is, not, a, is not an all or nothing game, right? You, you, you have to shoulder all these kinds of risks in a very decentralized way because it's a very complex phenomenon. There's virus risk, but there's also the risk of not being able to provide for your family and not being able to have a livelihood and all these things. So, you know, I don't know, I don't know all the ins and outs of Sweden, but it looks interesting. Um, I, I, there's clearly been some Asian countries that have not gone the full draconian lockdown route. There are other European countries that are not going that route. Uh, Belarus, uh, famously, the president said they should just drink vodka. Um, and and let's see, you know, the data will, will eventually speak for itself. Um, and I think it's going to be absolutely fascinating. I'm really glad that we've got one or two of these countries or a handful of these countries doing things differently. Um, final comment on this, Ernst, is I think if you look at the American system, um, <clears throat> there's, a lot, there's a lot of problems that America has, and we can spend hours talking about them. But I've once again been impressed by the relative federal nature uh, of of the United States. Federal, I suppose, in the South African sense. Uh, when, when Americans talk about a federal, something being federal, they're, they're talking about the central government running it. In South Africa, when we talk about federalism, we're talking about state governments or, or decentralized governments running things. What you see in the United States is, is more of a deferring to the state governors to make their own policies. And I think that's really important. And I think it's it could give America uh, a bit of an advantage coming through this whole thing, that they do have different states making different policies, adjusting their, their risk policies you know, at a state level. I, I just think it's probably still too much of an aggregated level to manage risk. I think that you know, particularly a place like California has got 40 million people. It is basically a, a country. So, so there's probably still too much centralization, but I like this idea of, of, of decentralizing uh, risk management. Mm. And then also, I think uh, you made a very important point there. I think that it's too early to tell to really say uh, who's doing it right and who's doing it wrong. I think a lot of people now are keeping themselves busy, busy with uh, irrelevant debates if, of saying, like, if we just followed our idea, uh, things would have been better. And I think there will be even more of a finger pointing after this whole thing has passed. I think yeah. the mantra will be pretty much, uh, if only we had uh, followed our plan, everything would have been better. And that would have been said by the leftists, the right wingers, the anarchists, the Democrats, yeah. the Republicans, whatever. Yeah. And now that we're looking at, for example, we're talking about how countries are dealing with this and you're talking about how uh, America specifically is, talk, uh, is dealing with it. If you look now, let's focus more on South Africa in terms of the political aspect of this. What do you think? What do you see down the line are the political ramifications of not only the lockdown, but also the following uh, recession or even depression? Well, look, that's a that's a very big and broad question. Um, maybe I'll try and break it up into some chunks. Let me just say the first thing that comes to my mind on that question is that my sense at 
this point is that if you went very aggressively for lockdowns or for for you know semi lockdowns in the early stages of this crisis i think you 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 got some political favor and and capital behind you that seems to have been the initial reaction but my sense is that that's fleeting and that's quite short term and that as we go forward and as the economic pain starts to bite it's going to the, the guys with the political capital will be the people who can navigate their countries out of the lockdown quickly safely effectively and so my sense with with the ANC strategy which looks to be shaping up to be an absolute mess uh confusion reigns uh it's a chaotic bureaucratic uh sort of mess that's going on at the moment and, and let's hope that they can sort of clarify some things in that in, in the next few days but my sense is that if the ANC pushes this too hard um they lose they lose politically through all this i think mr ramaphosa um you know who's probably loving his support on facebook and uh, amongst amongst you know middle class suburbs and so on um if he pushes this country too hard and he pushes us you know too too far down into the the mire the economic mire um i think he loses politically from this i just i just can't see how you can win politically from that situation unless you you go on some major major public relations blitz where you sort of have to propagandize the country that you you saved you know hundreds of thousands maybe millions of lives by doing the lockdown um but short of that he's basically got to got to manage a country now that has that has uh that, that faces a, a really really huge economic crisis and the ANC look like they want to double down on their hyper regulation over regulation you know all this kind of stuff so i think the ANC can particularly Cyril Ramaphosa can i think lose quite badly here um if he pushes us too hard and what you see is a guy like Julius Malema waiting in the wings he's been very quiet i mean he's he's chipping in now and then but he's basically just i think being quiet and watching how this crisis unfolds and he's going to look to choose his his moment to kind of break one way or another and i suspect the way that he's going to be able to break you know eventually is towards the kind of as per his dna the sort of populist left um direction of the anc messed up you know the anc didn't manage this properly he'll have criticism about how they've managed this economy so he can do it that way the, the da could benefit in some ways i suppose i don't i don't know really if they will um i just think that on the whole it's it's i don't think it's going to end well for for the anc if they keep pushing this too hard and i think that's politically true globally so i think i think if trump wants to have a chance to win in november i think he's you know because it's it's such a calamity for him here in his last year of his first term to be facing this level of crisis but presidents in crisis can use it to their advantage and if they if they spin a positive message and if he spins a kind of uh, i think of the one the, the thing i said was get america moving again like the inverse of maga you know to be like gamma <laughs> get america moving again positive message get back to work let's be safe let's look after ourselves if the democrats at that point are still spinning a kind of lockdown pro lockdown sort of ethos which is really a pro poverty sort of ethos um i think i think that trump could then could then benefit so you know it's going to play out like super in a very complex and super interesting way over the next few months and uh, and i you know we'll probably all be wrong on our political prognostications this year because it's so complex but my sense is that the the political strategy now is to break for optimism and for opening up i think boris johnson's looking to angle that way again i think smart politicians will start to angle for for opening up soon because the the pain is now really starting to weigh on people well um there's also this big opportunity now that i'm seeing that if the majority of the industrial world is still locked down and you can get get in early and open up your economy that's a huge injection to really help you mitigate some of the the economic yeah. effects if you can really get ahead and i think if there's going to be a country that takes that cowboy risk it's definitely going to be the united states and like you said yeah. you could it, it 
like a, a chaos has negative aspects, but there's also opportunity in the midst of it. Yeah, look, one thing people must realize about Americans is that they are, uh, and I say this in the sort of best sense, but it does have its downsides, but they are workaholics. You know, the Americans work really hard and they like to work. You know, the business of America is business. And uh, I don't think it's going to be easy to keep Americans sitting at home for too long. Um, other countries have slightly different ethos uh, and some countries secretly in their sort of social psychology might to a degree, at least a certain class of people enjoy the, the, the break, enjoy the holiday if you like. But of course, on the ground in a place like South Africa, people are desperate, desperate to get back to work because this is their bread and butter, literally. <laughs> you know, this is how people eat. This is how people feed their families, uh, clothe their children in a, in, a, in a looming winter. Families need to be buying, you know, clothes for their children. They need to be buying food. And so um, I, I think that every day, you know, so much changes on a daily basis now. You have, uh, you know, we've got accelerated time at the moment. It's not normal times. Every day things change by a lot. And I think every day we're on lockdown, there's a very, very big increase in frustration. And I just think the ANC are reading it wrong. I, I know that they're aware of the frustration. I just think somehow they think that they can uh, manage it. They can benefit from it somehow perhaps they think they can increase their power their their, their socialistic power their, their sort of securocrat power they might be right but there's going to be a big cost to that there's going to be big consequences they might for a while feel like they're gaining uh, uh they're making inroads into their, their their national democratic revolution strategy and that they're actually advancing that strategy but it's going to come i think with a very very big uh a very very big political cost mm. And yeah, uh, like I said, uh, or uh, like I've said on social media, they don't seem to want to let a good crisis go to waste. And I've seen here in the live chat, I think you know exactly who this is. Ivo Fachter uh, has a question for you, Russell. Uh, he asks, <laughs> with the money printer going brr, what are your inflation <laughs> expectations? You know, it's the hardest question, and that's why I've always asked it, because he's a smart guy and he knows it's, uh, it's, he knows it's a tough one. He wants um, to put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah look the, the thing with inflation is that you've always got you've always got i suppose competing forces of deflation and inflation the the, the deflationary forces i suppose are the um the forces that come about after a bubble once a bubble is bursting and stock markets are falling and no one's borrowing anymore and the banks aren't lending as much you get less money supply creation by the banks. Uh, you get, uh, and, and then you get all sorts of things like we've seen in this in this crisis, which are not typical, of course, the way it's happened, but they, they are broadly typical. And that you get commodity price deflation. I mean, no one expected oil to go negative, for goodness' sake. Oil price went below zero, <laughs> which is uh, it has a whole bunch of sort of technical reasons around the storing of oil and the fact that there was no more storage space and all that. But basically. There are kind of these these deflationary or disinflationary or price falling uh, uh, pressures. Um, the counter to that is that, and this is this is so so the the deflationist camp will look at all that stuff and go, you see, there's deflation coming because no one's lending. If anything, credits debts being paid back. The banks are struggling to find opportunities to make new loans which is to say grow the money supply because they grow the money supply when they make new loans um and the commodities are, are, are at zero or, or super cheap and this is all basically deflation um the problem with that view is that on the other side of the of the ledger you've got central banks actually creating new currency creating new money supply and contrary to popular belief uh, particularly in a place like the US, most of this money supply does not get trapped anywhere, does not get trapped in the banks. It does make it into the economy. They print the money, they buy bonds, and it gets into the economy. It gets out of the banking system and into the economy. Right now, US money supply is growing at its fastest pace um, on record, and the records I have go back to World War II. There, you can get earlier records, and I suspect World War II itself, there was probably higher money supply growth because governments print money during war. But we got the fastest money supply growth now 
since World War II in the United States. That is, and it's a and it's a big number. We're talking, we're talking uh, something like eighteen, nearly twenty percent year on year money supply growth in a major economy like America. That's a big deal, and that dwarfs anything that we saw during the financial crisis of two thousand and eight. So this is on a whole nother level. Now, the, one of the reasons why you print money like that is because you're worried that all this debt, okay that you've got in your system is going to default, is going to be impaired, and that's going to uh, cause the banks to go bankrupt and to, to go insolvent and to, and to basically go bust. And so essentially what you're doing is you're trying to substitute the debt for, for money. It's called monetizing the debt. And you can monetize government debt, but you can monetize all kinds of debt. In Zimbabwe, in Zimbabwe's hyperinflation, that's essentially like the perfection of debt monetization you basically monetize all the debt and you turn you turn every debt obligation that, that's outstanding into basically a monetary asset of course the problem is that uh, when that gets too out of control you you end up creating hyperinflation so that's a very long-winded backdrop to dodge a, a very good question but i would say this i think that we are building up for um for a bad inflation problem this time that was not the case after 2008. They printed a lot of money, but they didn't print that much. They didn't print as much as people thought in the US. Um, and there were other sort of countervailing forces that were sort of quite deflationary. This time around, I think they're printing way more money. Um, and we've got a genuine supply squeeze problem. We've got a shortage of supply, lots of money printing taking place. So I think that the initial impact of this in South Africa and abroad is is visibly deflationary because oil prices are down, lots of prices are down. But if you keep your eye closely on certain agricultural commodities, they're actually starting to go up um, and there's a lot of new money creation happening. And the Reserve Bank of South Africa is starting to print money as well, not nearly as aggressively as overseas, but it's starting to, it's starting to liquefy the banking system and starting to buy assets from the banks. And so that's going to start causing our money supply growth to kick up. So my view would be that that after an initial period of, of disinflation, deflation, or very soft inflation, as we look through the course of this year into next year, I think inflation could become a real problem. And I think that's, that's the thing that investors need to be worried about the most. The, the deflation risk, I think, is far less of, of a problem than the inflation risk that I think is coming. Um, because we have bond yields around the world. We have interest rates sitting down at zero, and they cannot stay there if inflation meaningfully goes up. And that could end up be the, being the bursting of, of the biggest bubble in history, probably, which is the government bond bubble, the US government bond bubble, the European government bond bubble. This is one of the biggest financial bubbles we've ever known, and it's very, very vulnerable to higher inflation. So I think that's a key thing for, for your viewers and for, and for listeners to, to look out for. Right, and while we're on the the topic of the the money printer going, brr, uh, <laughs> I see. Well, I've seen on social media a common. Uh, so now that you're saying that the South African Reserve Bank is also printing money, the 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 layman's argument that I see commonly on social media is that, um, but the U.S. is doing it, and this country is doing it, and this country is doing it. Why can't South Africa? And uh, maybe uh, that's a question for you, just to give it almost like a. They say, uh, explain it to me like I'm five. But explain yeah. why, Look, it, what's the flaw in that logic? That if you point to other countries doing it, you just explain how the US is doing it. Why can't South Africa as well? Well, I guess the, the most simple, straightforward answer is, is we don't have to be monkey see, monkey do, right? You don't have to, you don't have to copy uh, what someone else is doing uh, just because. Um, I think that's fairly obvious. So just because someone else is doing it, um, I always like to say with South Africa that we we succumb to copying or following international worst practice. That is very true a lot of the time with South Africa. We seldom take the best ideas from the rest of the world. We often take the worst ideas. Um, at, at, a, at a, I guess, a more pragmatic, practical level, um, when emerging markets, when small emerging market undeveloped economies print money, it's always far more devastating than when rich, you know, wealthy, highly capitalized, developed economies print money. And that's because basically when you, when you print money, you're essentially uh, creating a process of, of 
um, consuming savings. That money enters the economy and it typically increases consumption. You diminish your savings and you consume capital ultimately. You consume real wealth. And what you find obviously in these big economies is that they've got tremendous uh, bases of real wealth and they actually haven't printed as much money as you as you think or ha as has been uh, sort of portrayed relative to their wealth base. Um, you know, the, the U.S. money supply is <clears throat> is somewhere in the region, uh, I'm just going to ballpark it, but it's, it's somewhere in the region of about $14 trillion. So if they print a trillion dollars, which is a huge number, I mean, it's a, and it's a lot of money, it's a lot of money. But if they print a trillion dollars, they increase their money supply by, you know, 7 or 8%, which is a big, it's a big increase, but it's not, it's nowhere near hyperinflationary and it's nowhere near you know, it's not, it's not problematic for the confidence in that currency, bearing in mind that the dollar is the global reserve currency. So it's more than just Americans who need the dollar. Uh, when a small, a small country like South Africa uh, prints money, we have to be extremely cautious and careful. Now, we do have a more sophisticated financial system. We would print money in a more sophisticated way than they did in Zimbabwe, for example, than they did in Venezuela than they did in, uh, in Ghana in 2013 and 14. But what you find is when, when emerging market central banks print money and they do it in, in fairly large scale, um, their currencies come under immense strain. The Ghanaian city lost half its value in about a year. That would be like the Rand going to 40 or you know, 38 in, in, the, in the course of a year from, from here. So, um, so the way emerging markets uh, are seen, the way that investors treat emerging markets, it just makes it different. Uh, but again, it all depends on the quantum of money being printed. And I suppose the final answer is that what you tend to see in emerging markets is more unrestrained money printing. You tend to see a lack of political constraint on the central bank, on the money printing process. Again, in South Africa's case, we have quite a well-behaved central bank. It's going to take a bit more political uh, decay and a bit more political corruption, specifically of the central bank, for us to move into that that next tier of really badly behaved emerging market central banks. And that's when the rand, the risk on the rand, becomes extremely high. And I think we're moving towards that direction, but we still have a very, very sensible central bank governor and a central bank institution that's still fairly well managed. So, on the whole. If we keep our money printing efforts in this crisis, you know, fairly conservative and contained, we might, we might actually just about get away with it. But we've got to be very, very careful. Yeah, no, it sounds like a tightrope walk, definitely. And just here, a comment that made me chuckle on the inside because I didn't want to interrupt you. Uh, Robin <laughs> says, what happens to the U.S., uh, to us in SA when Trump puts the USA back on the gold stand? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, you know, we we've been uh, we we dream of of the gold standard again, and we dream of maybe the Bitcoin standard, um, and we dream of maybe a world of of more sound, more rationally, uh, you know, well managed money, free market money, um, and the world we actually have is a world of very very heavy state control over the financial system, and I think it's. Under real strain, I think I think their control of the financial system is under real, real strain. And when I say them, I say I mean America, but also governments in general. Their ability to to control their currencies, to control their financial systems, with the with the advent of new technologies that are that are coming, you know, not just cryptocurrency, but all kinds of payment technologies and payment solutions, makes government's job increasingly difficult in this regard. And so. I think we are probably in the process of moving towards some sort of big change in the, in the world monetary system. I hope it's a great change. I hope it's a good change. It might for a while not be such a great change. It might be, it might be the elites, the, the Americans along with the Europeans and perhaps the Chinese consolidating some sort of, sort of super fiat currency system that, that could perpetuate for a little while. Um, it's hard to know, but um, but certainly I think, you know, short of actually having a gold standard and actually having a cryptocurrency standard, my view is that 
owning these sorts of assets, um, at least in some in some size that you're comfortable with uh, from a risk perspective, is a very, very good idea because we're living in a world now where we're seeing patent mismanagement of economies by um, by policy elites, and we're seeing outright monetary mismanagement. And, and the Federal Reserve, the, the Central Bank of the United States, is making it up as they go along. They are making new rules. Yesterday they came out with a new rule that said they could print money and buy the municipal bonds of towns with more than 250,000 people. <laughs> you know, just like this crazy bureaucratic, you know, made up policy as they go. So they're just trying, basically trying to find all kinds of excuses to print money. And in that sort of world, you want to be defensive. You want to be holding assets that have a proven track record to, to protect you through these sorts of times. Bitcoin obviously doesn't have a long proven track record. It's got a track record of incredible, you know, returns since its early days. Gold obviously has a few thousand years of track record through wars, through famines, through through hyperinflations, and I think it's it's that sort of track record that you that you need to rely on. What else can you rely on? You know, it's very very difficult to, to rely on anything else. Sorry, you can rely on toilet paper. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can always rely on toilet paper. So. And and as you know, and of course, that's a perfect link into money printing because eventually the money becomes toilet paper. But uh, right, you need, to, you need to start investing in the wheelbarrow industry, I reckon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So look, you know, let's see, let's see. I don't want to spend too much time on that because I know you got other questions to ask. But uh, we, we we need to just be alert. It's very complicated. Monetary systems are very complicated, and the politics around money is very very uncertain and very complicated. And it's and it's a big game of power politics. And, you know, libertarian-minded people mustn't just think that next week we're going to get a nice Bitcoin standard. You know, this is going to be many years in the making that we that things change. And what you're going to probably find is that the elites are going to make sure that they're on the right side of that new shift. And so they have to position themselves first and then they'll let it happen. And I don't know, we're just going to have to see how that plays out through this crisis um, and how people respond to all this money printing because if people start dumping the dollar if they start not wanting to own the dollar uh, like seriously they want to get rid of the dollar you're going to start seeing us dollar inflation price inflation gold price is going to go up commodity prices are going to start going up there's going to be a loss of confidence in the us as a, as a political entity that could be a very very big moment but we, we just got to wait and see how badly behaved the federal reserve is actually going to get through this crisis mm -hmm. And now to, to take this, uh, to bring this conversation back again uh, to the domestic issues that we're seeing and the, the lockdown here in, here in South Africa, I think a very important question that needs to be discussed, or actually just an idea that needs to be explored, is if you look at the lockdown timeline, where at the beginning of the lockdown, I can't even remember how many days, I think 37 now, <laughs> I've lost track. 30, yeah, well, at the beginning of the lockdown, uh, we actually saw very strong support in South Africa for the lockdown. Uh, the majority, the vast majority of South Africans polled said they supported the lockdown and to some extent. And now you are arguing that you actually rather look at countries like Sweden as a role model. Now, what should the ANC have done then in the face of seeing po uh, popular demand and the public demand and the zeitgeist yeah. pretty much saying, uh, the lockdown is what we want, but for example, if you were the, the president's advisor and you're saying, but yeah. uh, hold on a lot of minutes, maybe uh, they don't know what they're doing or what they want, yeah. what they need, yeah. <laughs> what would your, your reply there be? Yeah, so, so I think this is, is a really good question because it's easy to criticize um, and then the question is, well, what would you have done in the heat of the moment? Mm -hmm. um, I've got a few comments on this. I mean, I think, let me first concede that in the heat of the moment, these are, of course, tricky decisions. Um, but I don't think that they need to be rushed. I don't think that they needed, they needed to have been rushed. The, um, the second comment I'll make is that I think that the popularity of lockdown is, uh, in the way you've articulated it, I think is, was, um, was overestimated. Um, I don't think that there was as much popularity as, as you suggest. I think that the popularity resided, and I'm not saying this is not influential on the, on the political powers. I think that popularity mainly resided in what I would call 
um, I guess, elite opinion, uh, the chattering classes, the not, not, not just elites, I think, I think middle classes to, to a degree started getting on board with it. Um, but I don't think that there was a groundswell of consciousness around lockdown amongst South Africa's uh, real poor communities. I just don't think that that's true at all. In fact, I think when lockdown came, I think it was seen by most poor South African communities as an incredibly strange, completely unnecessary, very alien thing. So from a populist perspective, I don't think Mr. Ramaphosa had to make that call. I think he made the call almost as a Davos type elite. I think he made the call because, because the elites across the globe were making the call. Um, and what you got was you got elite, you know, corporate leaders jumping on that bandwagon. If I think back to, to, uh, what was it now? Um, March. Yeah. Time is a very strange thing at the moment. Um, if I think back to March, um, we went on lockdown on the 26th of March. Um, a week before that, Mr. Ramaphosa gave his first, I think it was about a week before that, gave his first national address. Maybe it was 10 days before that. And it was in that address that he, that he called to the seriousness of the threat. And I noticed a very perceptible change in public opinion the very next day. The very next day, there was more social distancing. There was more fear. Um, there was more concern. And I'm not just saying it was fear mongering, but th there was more of everything. There was there was a, a change in consciousness. So the president has a very, very important role uh, as broadcasting the narrative. And I think the president's broadcasts actually were part of what got the narrative going pro lockdown. I think that if he'd gotten up and given an equally measured well-considered speech but said um this is this is potentially a, a big uh, health threat however we cannot afford to shut down society and risk millions of unemployed uh, a huge spike in in poverty and the health problems and the mortality problems that 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 come with poverty and all that if he'd given a well-measured well-structured speech and then moved on to to a kind of sweden type model um i think people would have gotten on board i think people are so desperate particularly in the middle classes and the middle and upper classes to love cyril i think they would have gotten on board with that i really really do so so i i, I kind of reject this notion that he had no option that he had no choice i also think that leaders good leaders can take temporarily unpopular decisions now Given all that, I, I would still say that I would still grant you there would be a counter argument to say that, no, it actually was a tough choice and the whole world was kind of moving in one direction. Um, to which I would say, fine, uh, we had the lockdown. Um, there seems to me to be no reason why the government can't now pivot. Um, well, I know the reasons why they're not. But, but theoretically, there's no reason why they can't now change their mind and pivot and make good decisions from here on out. They could have made good decisions after the initial three-week lockdown. I don't think we needed the extension. And I don't think we need this, this very strange, complicated, bureaucratic extension into May. So regardless of what happened at the start, even though I think it was avoidable, um, and I was certainly opposed to it from day one, and I, and I didn't think that, that it presented the risk that we thought, but more than that, I didn't have as strong of views about the virus as I did about what lockdown was going to do and how bad that was going to be for us. And I think that's starting to manifest now. And, and I just really would love to see them now, given what's gone, what's happened. So what's, what's done is done, right? It's a sunk cost now. <laughs> so there's no use crying over spilt milk. Now that what's done is done, I'd like to see them pivoting in a much more intelligent, data responsive uh way but unfortunately i think we've now got a government that has seen an opportunity here to entrench its power to scapegoat its failures on a virus and to and to basically as you said not waste a good crisis um, and i think i think there's two main prongs to this i think there's the securocrat prong 
you know, I spoke to France Cronier on my podcast and he, he, he outlined the securocrat wing and the, and the socialist wing. The securocrats is the security cluster, it's the sort of state capture brigade. These are the guys who want to increase uh, surveillance, they want to increase the, the budget of the intelligence wing, of the military, of the police. Um, and they're, they're kind of building their empire over there. And then you've got the socialist wing, uh, I guess spearheaded to a degree by Ibrahim Patel. And they are looking to entrench uh, their program, which is, which is you know, everything from, you know, more BEE to, to you know, I think, I think ultimately more taxation, more regulation, more state say over who gets to produce what. Um, and I think that they are reveling in this opportunity right now to, to pick companies and to pick industries and to pick risk levels and to basically fiddle with this machine called society and called the economy. Um, I think they're really enjoying it. So, so I just think that uh, my, my concern is that, so yes, we can look back and say it was a tough choice that he had to make. I don't think it was as tough as people think. Having made what I think to be the wrong choice and having come through that um, and having and saying and, and looking back with hindsight now, it's now saying, right, now we've got to pivot in a really smart way. And unfortunately, I think that this pivot into May is, is, is going to be as devastating, as destructive as what we've been through in April. And so that, that's my very big concern as we, as we look ahead now, Ernst. And yes, uh, I'd just like to take this opportunity to just thank everyone uh, that has tuned in and everyone that has left a like and everyone taking part in the chat. It's really enriching the, the conversation. I'm getting some excellent uh, comments here. And one of them is, uh, Jesse wants to know, do you have a podcast, Russell? What is the name of your podcast? <laughs> you know what? So I do a podcast for my clients. It's, I call it the ETM Macro Podcast. And it's just for my paying clients. So it's a very exclusive podcast. Um, but what I've started to do is, is certain interviews that I do. I don't, it's not only interviews. Sometimes I just do monologues for my clients, uh, you know, analyzing various things. But if I interview a great guest and I think it's worth public release, then with about a, a week or so's delay, maybe even a bit less, I'll release it on a public platform. So it's ETM macro podcast. I've, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's hosted at Anchor FM, and you can get it on uh, most of the major podcast platforms now. I think I think Apple Podcasts now has it as well. ETM Macro Podcast. I've done two two shows with Jonathan Witt and uh, Dr. Franz Cronier, both Jonathan, a medical doctor, Franz Cronier, um, the IRR uh, CEO. Very very cool, very very useful conversations that I had with them about the coronavirus the medical, but also the political threats. Franz Cronier's, uh, the interview with Franz Cronier, go check that out. It's, it's, it's excellent, as is the one with Jonathan Witt. But the stuff I'm talking about right now, Franz lays it out in a very, very useful way. And, uh, and you start to get a nice, clear picture of the sorts of constraints that Mr. Ramaphosa faces, even if he wanted to reform, which I, I'm skept very skeptical of. And perhaps we can get into that line of questioning. But um, even if he wanted to reform, he finds himself, I think, in a very, very small group of reformers amidst a very big party of what we might call securocrats and, and socialists. And, and I think he's, he's kind of just stuck in that place with not that much power. Perhaps he sees this crisis as a way to, to break those shackles a little bit. That's the optimistic view. Um, but given how he's conducting himself, given his lack of ability to rein in Mr. Ibrahim Patel, given his, his lack of ability to rein in Begi Tele, given his, his uh, you know, fraternizing with, uh, with Mr. Maduro from Venezuela and, and the Chinese and so on, I think that we've probably just got on our hands a stock standard, you know, dirigiste uh, president who wants to increase state power along with the rest of his party. Um, I, I mean, in the process, I think he wants a prosperous country, but I just don't think he has a clue of how to actually get there. I think that'll be a nice bonus for him uh, on the side. Uh, but I don't know if you've you've heard, Russell, but today, so Ramaphosa told South Africans, uh, we should be investing in Venezuela. So maybe after this interview, you probably be moving. Some, <laughs> did he, did some he actually aspect. say we should invest? Did he say yeah. we should invest in Venezuela? Wow. He said we should invest. I'm, I'm just going to put it on the screen because a lot of people are you know, you know what's You know what's amazing about that? It, it shows you... It, it shows you the, the inequality that you get, um, how we're so unequal before the law, because 
if you are not a registered um, investment advisory professional mm. and you give financial advice, now I wouldn't, I don't care if people do that because financial advice should be able to be dispensed by anyone. But um, you can be hauled over the coals by the regulatory bodies. But the president can go and tell you to invest in Venezuela. I mean, it's. it's yeah, astonishing. there's the tweet on the screen. Uh, president Maduro congratulated South Africa on the 26th anniversary of Freedom Day and invited South African businesses to invest in Venezuela for our countries to strengthen economic relations. Venezuela and South Africa count on each other as key allies in global solidarity. Okay, so, so now let, let, let's just take that. I mean, People, people want to believe the absolute best in this president. They, they believe that he is different from, from the, the kleptocrats and he's different from the socialists and he's a reformer and he's a forward thinker and he's got, he's got all these great uh, intentions. Just, just listen to what these guys are saying. Listen to his speeches. Read his tweets. Look at his track record. I mean... There's there's nothing in there to to tell you that 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 optimistic outlook that Ramaphoria outlook is is a viable outlook, and for me, I just think if if he's going to reform, and I'm wrong because I don't think he can and I don't think he will, but let's say I'm wrong, let him prove me wrong. Let him prove me wrong with hard action, with proper let it, let him let him walk the talk. You know, let him walk the walk. So, so I just my sense with SA is stop pretending that and stop trying to predict that one day this president of ours will reform. Just look at what's being done, and when you see a reform, put it put it to their credit. You know, and when you see another one, put it to their credit. But until you see those things, this is a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You're never going to get there. <laughs> But, but Russell, you're talking about a president that's never going to reform. He keeps talking about the structural reforms, and Tito Mbueni is also promising structural reforms. What are they talking about then? Structural reforms, that phrase, is, is a blank canvas. Um, it's a blank canvas for whoever says it, by the way. It, it, it gets said in Europe all the time. The European Central Bankers always say we need structural reforms, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, it's... It's a blank ideological canvas, and and I, and I think he says it to 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 sort of play this obfuscation game, um, where he's trying to keep everyone on sides. He's trying to keep he's trying to keep the socialists on on, on side. He's trying to keep the securocrats on side. He's trying to keep you know big business supposedly on side. He's I don't know you know, but the, everyone says he's such a great leader, but that's not the mark of a great leader. The mark of a great leader is not a fence sitter who tries to obfuscate his language to essentially create a pretense so that everyone is happy in some sense or, or pretends that they think he's going to do what they want him to do. That's, that's not good leadership. Good leadership is, is decisive action in, in, a, in, a, in a constructive direction. And it means you've got to piss a few people off along the way, sometimes many people off. And you should end your your tenure um, hated by a lot of people if you've been a good leader um, and um, and and that's not that's not mr Ramaphosa. so so yeah i just don't think we've seen we've seen sufficient evidence of that and so structural reform is a blank canvas which i think means um, more anc policy more national democratic revolution um, that, and, you know, it's interesting. They don't like talking about the NDR, the National Democratic Revolution, in public. It, it is, of course, official, basically official policy in all their policy documentation. But they use the, the acronym NDP, which is the National Development Plan, okay, which is supposedly the, the nice reform strategy. But I just think that that's basically a veil for the, for the NDR. It's a veil for... For more state involvement, Mr. Mbaweni got it the other day and said he wants eight out of ten, something like this. I didn't exactly hear the quote, but something like eight out of ten restaurant staff. No, must must be South Africans now. You know, so now we're now we're taking this huge um, foreign, mostly Zimbabwean population that we've had that we've hosted in South Africa for for a few decades now. <laughs> oh, and now now they're just second class citizens. You know, um, these guys have a very very nefarious economic agenda. It's very left-leaning. It's socialist in many respects. It's certainly dirigist. It's statist. And 
they're just not showing us the proof that they're anything other than that show us the proof show us your track record you know and when you show us that we'll start to get on board um let's stop with the hope strategy and let's just use the evidence strategy <laughs> and now well seeing as we are seeing a lot of, it seems like we are being prepped or uh, being conditioned that we are going to accept more lockdown extensions it's been 37 days roughly a month I mean, yeah. we're probably going to see another month extend or another month of lockdown, at least uh, to a large extent. What is the just for people that maybe don't uh, aren't that uh, economically literate? What's the difference between a one month lockdown and a two month lockdown? Is a two month lockdown just double the previous one in terms of effects and impact, or is there a certain discrepancy there? Yeah, it's it's a good question, and it's interesting that again, this is a it seems to be an issue where economists have found some sort of common ground independently of one another which is to say that at the margin the incremental impact of the second month i think is going to be way worse than the first month the first month um you're still living off savings um you know it, it could almost have been like a christmas period you know most people just off work people took their christmas early this year you know and we work through december um now that's i'm trivializing it the first month has been much much worse than that um, and of course we haven't been able to go to restaurants we haven't been able to go to you know most retail outlets it's been a it's been an absolute there's been absolute carnage in the job market um but as you move into the month two you now start to hit more people who are, are running out of savings so in month one a certain group of people already run out of savings well that just hits another group in month two um plus the first group right the first group didn't get anything more in the second month either so the first group suffered in month one they're suffering even more in month two and then new groups are getting added to that in month two so to the extent that we continue a very draconian lockdown and and so far level four quote unquote level four um unless there's negotiations happening behind the scenes which i know there are the whole time and unless that gets revised pretty dramatically level four looks uh, i think someone made a joke you know level four is 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 level five plus cigarettes or something you know <laughs> um, which, which is which is um which is obviously not strictly true but it's it's kind of gets the point right it's 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 very draconian so another month of that now are they going to do a month gosh i hope not i mean I, my sense would be that it's maybe two weeks of level four but i've been overly optimistic the whole time so i've been a bit wrong on on my lockdown predictions i i gotta say i i overestimated the government's ability to understand how bad this was going to be and they've just made it they've just gone worse than my expectations every time i didn't expect the three i actually didn't expect the initial three weeks to even go the full three weeks i just thought this is this is mad you know you <laughs> you're causing people untold harm but they went the three weeks and then they extended it for another two that totally shocked me i kind of got the the, the, the level four prediction right so I'm, maybe i'm starting to finally calibrate my my lockdown predictions with with where the government's at so i'm thinking maybe two weeks another two weeks and maybe they go in two week increments and it sort of gets us out of this thing by the end of june um by end by the end of june maybe we're in some something like what what might be called the level one i, I don't know um uh, you know but but between now and, and the end of june that's two months of full or partial lockdown so uh, you know i think what we've already done to our economy probably puts our gdp down by seven maybe ten percent for the year um and then what we're going to do in may and what we're going to do in june is going to hurt that even more so we could be looking at we could be looking at, a, at something like a 15 percent gdp decline in one year it is enormous huge huge stuff yeah, unprecedented and if they want if they want to extend that sorry beyond june to july august which which some people are even talking about we're, we're staring at a at, at a at a real real calamity here and it's not just rands and cents it's not just money in your wallet it's as important as that actually is it's all the social ramifications it's the it's the crime ramifications it's the political unrest it's the it's just everything that that is in a place like south africa 
And um, so I just think that they, they've unleashed, you know, a genie from the bottle here that every day that they don't put it back in, it just it just spreads and, and grows and becomes uncontrollable. And I'm really concerned about that. So, yeah, I know we've taken the full hour now, uh, uh, but I, I just I think I think that's an important place to dwell on here is is the, the lockdown is everything. The lockdown is so key here. So when people ask me about how do we stimulate the economy, what's the best fiscal policy, the best stimulus is ending the lockdown. End the lockdown under sensible risk management strategies, have some decent risk protocols in place for the virus. You know, by all means, limit certain densities of interactions. If, if they're very high density, very, you know, lots of people limit certain age groups from, from certain interactions because they're old and they're vulnerable. But basically, let everyone get on with with earning a, li a livelihood and 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 being productive in society. This is how life ticks over and goes on. And so, every decision around lockdown, if you if you want to become an armchair analyst and you want to analyze this for your own personal finances and, and you know for your own situation, every decision around lockdown is critical. Um, uh, how free. Uh, this economy will get or how constrained it will remain is critical and every day is critical so this is this is where the nub of the issue lies for me oh well uh, very good explanation there russell uh, definitely a, a lot of overlap with how i see things as well but then maybe as a conclusionary thought uh, i see this uh, term or phrase peppered all across your social media and that says law and i would just yeah. like to what that is and how this relates to the lockdown it seems to be some type of significance there so so says law is my is my little pet love if you like uh, of economics because it's so elegant and so simple and yet it's so hard for so many people to grasp mostly the people who don't grasp says law are economists themselves or sort of certain financial professionals who've who've grown up in a under a particular uh, school of thought but um, Say's law was is, is a is a principle first, I guess first articulated by a French economist called Jean Baptiste Say, and so we call, we talk about Say's law, Say's law, Say's law, um, and he essentially makes the very simple point, which believe it or not is rejected by most of the most of mainstream economics, that you can only consume if you produce or to the extent that you produce. Okay, now we know that that's true in the most basic sense. Even if we're on an island, a deserted island all by ourselves, we can only consume to the extent that we go and work and produce resources for us to consume, right? We can only consume if we catch fish or we pick fruit or whatever. In, in, in an exchange based economy, our ability to buy things in the marketplace uh, is presaged by our ability to create value first in the marketplace so we create value that we believe someone needs and then we enter the marketplace and we exchange that value with other people in the marketplace and the proceeds from that exchange we then use to consume so it's a, it's simply to understand that you can't have consumption without production um and, and, it's, and it's producing things and then bringing them to the marketplace in mutual exchange that is the economy. And that might sound like super trivial. And why am I talking about such a, an, an obvious and basic concept? Why is it in your Twitter bio? Yeah, exactly. Um, because every, every policy that is called stimulus, fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus, printing money, borrowing money to stimulate the economy, um inherently rejects says law because what they are saying is that we need to stimulate demand okay but demand is not the fundamental decisive factor the decisive factor is what is being produced how much of it is being produced and that is what determines that is what creates the purchasing power of people in the marketplace to to be able to demand things so when you want to stimulate an economy, it's no good printing money and giving it to people to, to buy things. It's no good talking about we need to stimulate demand, which leads to all the folly that we see in, in money printing and deficit spending and all this sort of stuff. 
the thing that you need to be doing is making sure that production and the factors of production and the resources that go into production are well organized, well allocated, and um, are being maximized. And we do that in a free market, a decentralized system that's not coerced by any state or government, where we allow prices to fluctuate freely. So once you start accepting the premise of Say's Law, you have a completely different view, not only of stimulus, but of what a recession is. In the mainstream thinking that rejects Say's Law, that would be the Keynesian type thinking, <clears throat> um, the rejection of Say's Law, they, they see a recession as a bad thing. And we've all been conditioned through the press and through the mainstream to think that a recession is, the bad, is a bad thing. Recessions are almost always healthy corrections from excess, okay? This recession that we're in is different. This is a regulatory recession where government has forced us to stop producing, okay? But the way to fix it is not to, is not to send checks to people and send money to people so they can buy more stuff. They can't buy more stuff. We're not producing it, right? You can only buy stuff that's physically being produced. So all that you're going to get, if you keep the lockdown in place and you print all this money, you're going to have to get inflation. And maybe this prop, maybe this a bit more emphatically answers Ivo's question from, from earlier, but you're going to have to get inflation if you continue to restrict supply, but you give people free money uh, and you borrow you know, money from somewhere and you pump it into people's bank accounts so that they can go and spend. The solution to the problem is they need to be able to go and produce that is the sustainable, healthy, um, real economic way to to get us out of this problem. So I hope that's not too boring. I hope I didn't like come across too confusingly. I've got an article, uh, not not very long. I've written one or two articles on Say's Law. It's a very elegant concept. Um, sometimes it can take a little bit of a while to click, but it's basically extremely simple and it's very commonsensical. And I'll send you the link, and you can maybe post it on a on a show notes page or. Maybe in the if this goes onto YouTube, uh, we can post it over there. But and I'll maybe link to it on Twitter, and you can retweet it or something. But I'll I'll, I'll show you some stuff on Say's Law. All right, now I'll definitely put it in the description uh, after the show. This is live, but uh, if you are watching uh, after the show, it is already in the description. Um, and yeah, I think that's a the perfect uh, idea to end the show on because I think it's so applicable to the whole lockdown ideology that we're seeing this cargo cultism, if you will where you're just seeing the ANC uh, copying what they're seeing abroad, but they're taking the worst parts of it, uh, not really understanding the basics that you have to get in place first before you uh, can make the way, before you can get the same results as the people you're trying to copy. But thank you very much for joining me, Russell. And then just the last thing, uh, where can people find you? Uh, what's your, uh, uh, on, uh, are you on any other social media platforms? Yeah. Except, yeah, so look, I, I'm, I'm not uh, I'm not someone who, who desperately needs to be found, but uh, I do tweet at Russ Lamberti. My uh, my website uh, is etmmacro.com. That's my business website. My personal website is russlamberti.com. I haven't blogged there for very long, but I do have some pretty interesting articles there. You'll see some sales law stuff there. Uh, probably haven't blogged there for three years or so, but but there's a bunch of stuff from the last ten years that I think people will find interesting. So russlamberti.com, at russlamberti on Twitter, and then etmmacro.com is is uh, is my professional website. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks, Ernst. Mm. And uh, the people seem to have enjoyed it quite a bit. They found what you said very enlightening and interesting. Uh, I've, thank you. I've been, really enjoying, I've been really enjoying watching the comments come through. I've seen all the guys. Some of them are interacting with me on Twitter, so it's really good to see the guys. Sideliner, Opinions. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Patty 6211 I see you guys I really appreciate it thanks a lot no and that's the wonderful thing about alternative media where this form of communication is beating the mainstream media is that type of interaction that type of real uh, connection between the people that are your not I don't want to say consumers but your listeners and your watchers and uh, them actually being to put give input on the show live i think that's a wonderful thing uh, and then, uh, on that note thank you everyone for tuning in thank you for everyone that uh, left a like if you are new to the show and you've just discovered this uh, somehow uh, please uh, click, click subscribe if you've enjoyed what you've uh, listened to here 
And then uh, I'll see you on the next one. Uh, keep an eye out. I'm talking to Ronaldo Gos on Thursday about specifically alternative media and the YouTube scene in South Africa, how uh, he's gone from uh, 500 people watching live to 20,000 people watching live. And then thank you. Well, lastly, thank you very much, Russell, for taking time out of your day to explain this very complicated thing called the economy in an actually in a simple way, uh, explaining it to us like we're five. <laughs> Great pleasure. Anytime. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, man. All right. Cheers, guys. Have a good one. Uh, stay safe. Wash your hands and uh, let's open the economy back up. <laughs>